Ladies and gentlemen, you're rocking with a goat. Ken Dow giving you motivation for growth. Two toes down, he keep it realer than most. He do it for the culture, that's always the goal. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. Hey, what's up? What's up, everybody? You tuned in to another episode of Strategic Moves. I'm your host, Ken Dow. This is a place where we bring art, culture, politics, and business all together. And we do it every Sunday right here on this channel. Today, it's all about arts. I got somebody, though, who's in our studio today who checks the box and everything. We talk about art, culture, politics, and business. We've got a guy here today who checks every one of those boxes. He's been in our community doing all of those things for the last over 20 years. And he's here today to share some of his experience with us and talk about some of his latest projects. And if you don't know who this guy is, I'm going to let you check out this little video. Hi, I'm Peter Lawson Jones, and I want to thank you for viewing my video reel. Get this out. Cool. Yep. Northern Pike, but not just any pike. It's the baddest pike that's ever come out of this lake. The locals call him Wes, Wicked Wes. You know, the people around these parts say that that fish will bring you luck if you throw them back in after you catch them. Now, I'm not much for old wives' tales, but a month after I wrangled them in, I became the owner of this place, and life's been treating me pretty good ever since. Never forget where you come from, because it is who you are and who you will become as a productive member of our society. I wish you all the best and brightest futures. I know that you are capable of accomplishing anything you set your mind to. So again, congratulations and best wishes. Uh, excuse me, guys. I'm sorry, but could you please keep it down just a little? I'm, I'm trying to get some work done here. Please. Thank you. So, if you don't know, now you know. Everybody, let's welcome Mr. Peter Lawson Jones, PLJ Chat Program. So how you doing there, sir? I'm doing fine today, spending a little time with my longtime friend, Ken Dow, who's been on the battlefield with me in politics oh. over the years. Mm -hmm. So it's good to be on Strategic Moves. Oh. Thank you for inviting me. No problem, no problem, man. You know, you're one of these people who's been in our community doing a lot of things. A show is a place where I say I kind of put things together to bring on people I found interesting to talk about topics that they're, hopefully there's something somebody can pick up from it and utilize there it in their go. business or their personal life. So, Peter. I Peter, hope I can drop at least one pearl of wisdom okay. over the next few minutes. Listen, I tell everybody, you check every one of those boxes. That's so we're going to start it. checking them because okay. we, you, you got a lot of territory. Where you want to start with? We're going to start with the politics. Okay. All, because <laughs> politics is where everything. No, we're going to start from the beginning because I have millions and millions of viewers all around the world that watch this show, okay. you know, and so everybody don't know who you are. Like, we well, I hope you've got a couple of casting directors that are watching so they never cast know. me in future films. You never know. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We never know who might. I'm going to be on my this. best behavior. Yeah, there. Right. We're going to really show them that you got talent. So just check this out. Let's talk about where you start. You from Shaker Heights. Have you always lived in Shaker Heights? Or I was you? born in Mount Sinai Hospital, right in uh, the center of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. My family and I lived in the Glenville area until I was about mm -hmm. in ninth grade. 
then we moved to Shaker. I graduated Shaker Heights High School. Then I had, I was fortunate enough to have been admitted to Harvard College. I majored in government there and I might add graduated magna cum laude. I'm kind of proud of that. You know, we ain't going to let you speed through this because Peter, you're an <laughs> impressive guy. And first of all, I told Latif and I told my daughter, Kenny, who produced the show, I want me one of those little air horns because every time I get a guest God, on I this ask my family to give me that for birthday present. I'd love to have yeah, an air I, horn. I need me one of those things, <laughs> those little buttons, man, because I, I, I want to go ahead and press because one thing is for certain, almost every guest that comes through our show at some way or another has them work their way through Glenville community mm. on off to other things. So it's never surprising when I talk to someone, they say they started their off roots in, were their in roots Glenville. were in Glenville and then they kind of moved on. And well, so, Glenville was quite the community. When I was growing up there in the late 50s and in the 60s, I lived on Osceola Avenue. Yeah, no, exactly. What as a matter of fact, the back of my house abutted that of Judge Charles Patton. Okay. And two doors down from Charles Patton was Zeke Four. It was a great community. And what mm -hmm. I remember the most about it is that although by the time we moved on the street, the last of the Jewish families and white families right. were moving out. As a matter right. of fact, initially, our councilman was uh, Mr. Goldstein, as I recollect. Wow. And then who succeeded him? George Four. So wow. the neighborhood was changing, but although Osceola Avenue was predominantly, if not all, African-American by the time mm -hmm. we moved on. There was a great socioeconomic diversity on the street. Mm -hmm. So there may have been a family that was struggling, but next door to them was somebody who worked at the Ford factory. Correct. Next Correct. door to them, somebody worked at the Correct. post office. Next door to them, mm -hmm. a teacher. As a matter of fact, my mother was a teacher. My dad was a chemist. Mm -hmm. Next door to them was a dentist. Mm -hmm. Next door to them was the person who owned the corner store. Right. Not just right. worked there, but owned it. So there were a lot of things that no matter what your personal situation was, no matter matter what your family situation was, mm -hmm. you could benefit from somebody living in that community. Mentors were right there. Role models mm -hmm. were right on that street. It was a very different time in Cleveland. Of course, this was before there was integration mm -hmm. of the suburbs. Okay. And so whether you were working class, middle class, poor, upper middle class, you were living on the mm -hmm. same street, interacting with each other and benefiting from the association. So Peter, you have brothers and sisters? I'm the only one. You're I'm the, the alpha, and the, I'm the omega, right? Really? Oh. So I've tripled my parents output <laughs> since I've got three kids. Shout out to Ryan, Leah, and Evan. Wow. Okay, so you're the only one. I'm the only one. And you say your dad was a chemist and your mom was a teacher. Yes. Now, when you say a chemist, it was my, he My dad school, graduated or? from Ohio University in 1942. Okay. He then went on to serve in the armed services. He was a member of the Tuskegee Airmen. You know, and I love to talk about my parents mm -hmm. of blessed memory. My dad had an opportunity. He was offered a contract with the Salt Lake City AAA baseball team. Wow. Wow. And had he accepted it, he might have been Jackie Robinson. Really? Because this was before Jackie Robinson. My dad was a great athlete, mm -hmm. wonderful human being, and obviously a very smart man. Right. Yeah, he's, he was a chemist at Standard Oil. What position he played in baseball? Outfield. Really? Yeah, he was an outfielder. Good hitter. Yeah, good hitter. Left-handed okay. hitter, right through right, batted lefty. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, six three and a half, mm -hmm. fast. So unfortunately, I was a decent athlete, but I had a <laughs> fraction of his ability. <laughs> Generation skipping talent. I, well, guess. I, I remember you used to play a lot of basketball. I sure did. I, I played mean, uh, full court basketball until yeah. I was sixty five, yeah. dealing with people who were a third or half yeah. my age. Yeah, I remember that. He was yeah, there. I love that. Peter, he playing basketball. Oh, that's where like, I would be if I wasn't working or mm -hmm. hanging out with the family. So your know, dad, he and, and my mother, I should point out uh -huh. was a Cleveland public school teacher. She oh. taught at Bolton okay. elementary school on Cedar. She taught first and second grade. And she was what I call that old school group okay. of teachers. Okay. So whatever the students needs were, if they needed food, she mm -hmm. would bring it. She, they needed clothing. She would bring it. They need a ride home. They got it, you know, and she would often bring some of her students home uh, over the weekends to hang out with me. Did she retire, teacher? She retired as a truant officer. Okay. They called them attendance workers. Okay. But she spent her, the majority of her career with the Cleveland public school system mm -hmm. was as a teacher. Okay. The last maybe 15, 20 years mm -hmm. was as a truant officer. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And you say your dad decided to go to college and he was the first in his family to attend college. I have forgot about that tidbit because that was something you had shared with everybody in your career. Let's talk a little bit about the Tuskegee Airmen, sure. portion a little bit of that and the importance of that, as well as the him going to college to be a kid back in those. The first thing, let me say this. There was no moment, a few moments in life where I was more proud than when I had my daughter and my youngest son. We were at the air show and we went 
wandered over to the tent where they had a lot of paraphernalia and books on the Tuskegee Airmen. And I opened up one of the books and there I saw my dad's picture, wow. class of 42F. That was just wow. such a, a wonderful moment for me. But dad uh, was at OU at a time, Ohio University at a time when he couldn't stay in the dorm. How about say so he went to Ohio University? This was right. the late 30s, okay. early 40s. Right. And fortunately, there were a group of white Methodist students who had a co-op and they invited my dad and another black student, George Mills, who became the first principal at John F. Kennedy High School okay. to live in the co-op with them. And these guys stayed in touch with each other throughout the rest of their lives. You know, I feel a, a special a warmth in my heart for those students who practiced their Christianity by opening up their co-op to black students at a time when, I don't know otherwise, where they would have lived. Really, really. Because right. they couldn't stay in the dorm. And my mom was amongst the first group of African-American women to live in the dorms at Michigan State University. My mom went to OU for a year. That's where mom and dad met. Okay. But the racism was so thick there. She transferred to wow. Michigan State. He hanged yeah. in there and, and stuck it out. Yeah, he stuck it out. Here's the ironic thing. He could not, even though he had played in the Negro Baseball mm -hmm. League, he couldn't play on the baseball team at OU because they had the Southern Tour was the most significant part of their schedule, being a Northern mm -hmm. team. Mm -hmm. The Southern teams would not take the field if you had a black ball player on your team. Wow. So instead he ran chat and became a hurdle champion. Wow. So he knew how to turn lemons into lemonade, to say wow. the least. Wow. So did he do the Tuskegee before college or after, after college? college right after college wow so he had a degree yeah what made him want to go fly airplane when think about it there were a million african-american men who fought in world war ii Mm -hmm. And notwithstanding the rights that were being denied at home, there was still a patriotism, which I think exists to this day. You know, he was filled with certain patriotism, like so many other African-American males at mm -hmm. that time. And so uh, he wanted to enlist and do his part. Mm -hmm. And so he signed up and was blessed enough to be admitted to that exclusive corps of men, uh, the mm -hmm. Tuskegee Airmen. He never ever asked him why he wanted to fly a plane. I mean, it ain't like you flying these planes today. It was like, <laughs> I'm good. Well, he Imagine. told me he told me stories about when they would fly the planes and then they would fly them upside down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> there's only that little top right. ceiling of the hard glass or plastic, hard plastic, whatever it was right. that separated you from <laughs> from the ground. I, I mean, well, he was an extraordinary individual, a lot of courage and curiosity, mm. intellectual wow. curiosity. And, uh, you know, I'm just proud. I'm so proud to say that he was, a, that my dad was a Tuskegee Airman. So when he got out, he didn't want to fly a plane? Here's the interesting thing. I mean, he was in the armed service for a couple of years, uh, and that's when he had the offer to go to Salt Lake City, okay. uh, AAA baseball okay. team. Right. But at that time, he was ready to move on with his life. Mm. He didn't see any future in baseball mm. at that point. He had done college and the armed services, and he was ready to settle down, get married, and start a family. And so you said chemistry. Chemistry was his major. And I remember going over to, they call it was called Sohio at the time. Yeah, I and I would that. go over to those labs off of Broadway. Okay. And he would take me there, you know, some nights when he had to go into work. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember getting milkshake candy bars out of that machine there. <laughs> They're still my favorites. I can't believe they no longer make milkshake candy. That was better than Milky Way as far as I'm concerned. Okay, all right, I got you. So, yeah, and then he became a high school recruiter and mm -hmm. then a college recruiter for Standard Oil. He used to travel all over okay. the country, especially okay. in the Midwest, recruiting people to work for Standard Oil Company. You know, one of my very first jobs I worked at Ohio. I tell my kids that all the time. I was a full service. Remember when you used to pull up to the gas station? Yeah. And you ring ding, ding, ding. You come uh -huh. on out and we used to change your or uh, check your oil and wipe your windows and those were the days, those days huh yeah i used to do that and um met a lot of people doing that man and then i i was right on the edge of i tell people i'm old but just that old you know i'm right on the edge when they just started going into self-serve self-serve right yeah, right it was right. like you know get rid of that well, well you know if you go in new jersey mm -hmm. you still you can't pump your own gas in new jersey they have really? yeah they have attendants that come out wow for whatever reason they don't i don't know if new jersey's the only state left that doesn't allow you to pump your own gas wow i feel kind of lazy when i pull up to a gas station now in new jersey oh well you know what <laughs> I, I, if they doing everything we used to do, because they used to clean your windows and we used to have to check your oil and all that stuff. But now cars, you wouldn't even want nobody touching your oil and stuff in your car. I People know. Well, the like, things uh, have become so high tech, yeah, right? You know, they don't, they planned it so that you don't touch you your don't own touch oil, right? right? You got to go to the dealership to get that done. Yeah, I worked at, um, yeah, it was so high before they turned it to BP. BP, yeah. right. 
Yeah. So that's and my dad was there for many years. And then wow. he was executive director of Neighbors Organized for Action and Housing, which built low and moderate income. Okay. Then he finished his career as an educator. He was athletic director, special assistant to the president, admissions officer at uh, Dyke College that then wow. became Myers University. Right? Okay. Well, he was an interesting guy. Absolutely. Very interesting. Both guy. of my parents. Wow. I, I always thought I got my acting ability from my mom. This is a fact. Had my mom been born 10 years later, she could have been a movie star. She had the beauty, the charisma, mm -hmm. the sense of humor. She was just fascinating. Wow. And uh, she told me stories about when she was in a play at the old Central High School. Mm. And it was a play uh, called In the Still of the Night. Okay. And uh, apparently she had a small role in it, but stole the show. So, so if, you know, if mom and dad, and this is the thing, when we look back on history, this is why you have to teach history as it is, mm -hmm. as it really happened. No ch straight, no chaser. Right. Because I think about the opportunities my parents didn't have because of when they were born. And these say the opportunities my grandparents and your grandparents right. and your parents. Right didn't have. But what they did for me and what I've tried to do for my kids, I think any good parent wants their kids to be smarter, more successful, mm -hmm. better looking, at least as happy as they yeah. are, right. if they're happy. That was clearly, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it was ever, if they ever articulated it, mm -hmm. but that's something they wanted for me. They wanted me to enjoy more opportunity than they did. And I have. That's why y'all moved from there and went to Shaker? It's interesting because I was in the major work program at, in the city of Cleveland, the Cleveland mm -hmm. Public School System, mm -hmm. and that was a tremendous program. Yeah. I worked everybody I knew who was in, cl in, in those classes with me mm -hmm. went on to the top colleges in the United States. Okay. And yeah, you uh, know what? They used to be really big. Oh, the major work yeah, program really was. Big, yeah. I worked as hard as that as I did it when we moved to Shaker or, mm -hmm. or even in some of my classes at, yeah. in college at Harvard. Mm -hmm. But my parents saw, you know, things were beginning to change. They wanted to make mm -hmm. sure that I had a solid education. They were either going to send me to a parochial school or send me to a private school mm -hmm. or uh, move to Shaker. Right, yeah. So, you so that's what they, they went did. to Shaker. Yeah. I, <laughs> As opposed to those other two options, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's yeah. cool. That's cool, man. I don't think I was meant for St. Ignatius and St. Edward New. No. Or even Western Reserve Academy. Though. So you did well at yeah. Shaker. Yeah. 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 So you I went did on, very well there. You did very well because you went on to Harvard, right? Correct. And, and you double majored in Harvard. Most I majored in what most people call political science. They called right. it government there. Okay. And like I said, I, I graduated with uh, high honors, magna cum laude. Wow. So, yeah. So I was a serious student when mm -hmm. I was there. And then you went to law school there also? Yes. I worked in between college and law school. I lived and worked in D.C. Mm -hmm. And I started out working for D.C. government. Then I worked for a congresswoman from California, Yvonne Braithwaite Burke, mm -hmm. who was the first woman to give birth while a member of Congress. Really? And she also was co-chair of the Democratic Convention in 72, I believe, mm -hmm. and was head of the Congressional Black Caucus. Wow. So she was quite successful. And then I got I ended up working with the Carter Mondale campaign transition mm -hmm. team and the I had a political appointment at HUD. Mm -hmm. And then I returned to Cambridge to start law school. So how you do in law school there? Didn't you do pretty well there? As well? Oh, I did well enough. Oh, yeah. I tell you something. Law school was probably the least fulfilling portion of my life. Really? I was just not as engaged. I was in law school because I knew a law degree would help me achieve what I wanted to do in the future. But, you know, some students just love law school in the classes. I liked some of them. Others I just endured. Mm -hmm. But I obviously did the graduate and to, to, to move on. You know, but I was day, not aspiring to be on law review and, and, you know, one day and I'm with gonna an get A somebody average at the, Harvard Law School. One day I'm going to get one of you lawyers on this show who's going to say, I really enjoyed law school. There are, some, there are some people who did. Everybody give me the exact same what, story what, you do. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and let me tell you, kid, that's why you find a lot of older lawyers uh -huh. who are looking for ways to get out of law <laughs> and get into other fields. Right, exactly. It's a grind. Right, right. That's what they said. It's That's a what grind. they said. Yeah. You know, so and, and it's amazing because again, the story be the same. Oh, no school, man. No, oh, man. I, I didn't even know if I was gonna do it. I barely got through it. Through it. I, I figured I was gonna do something else at the last minute. I decided I was gonna do it. it it's, it's well, law school is that. a great cat catch all for people okay. who to some extent aren't certain what they want to do, but mm -hmm. also a law degree prepares you to be successful in a number of different areas. You look at top business persons, many mm -hmm. of them are lawyers, politicians lawyers obviously a lot of teachers especially at the collegiate level mm -hmm. lawyers mm -hmm. and then you can practice law if all else fails and mm -hmm. there are all kinds of different fields of law mm -hmm. so i just think it's a very useful and flexible degree matter of fact i'm encouraging my youngest okay. uh, to go to law school he wants to he's at ohio state now mm -hmm. his last year mm -hmm. he's at the fisher school of business majoring in marketing mm -hmm. he makes beats okay. and he wants to manage uh, musical groups and musicians okay. and i okay. don't get a law degree right that makes you much more valuable 
valuable exactly. to those you want to represent. Oh, that, that's and he seems to be listening to me. We'll see what happens. That's, that's very true. And so you still practice in law? Yes, today. I do. I still as, practice as a little as... bit of law. Okay. Not a whole lot. And mm -hmm. I just do handle very little litigation, mostly transactional matters, you know, reviewing contracts, reviewing leases, uh, helping negotiate agreements and things like that. And then I have a consulting practice in community engagement. So I've had a lot of contracts with NOACA, mm -hmm. work on one now with the city of Shaker Heights. I've done a number with the city of Cleveland, mm -hmm. where uh, engineering firms and uh, planning firms go after contracts with the municipal bodies or governmental entities. And if there's a public mm -hmm. outreach component, they add me to the team to help win the contract and then to execute on the work. All right, Peter, we done talked about the culture a little bit. We done talked about business a little bit. We getting there, man. Let's jump into the good stuff. Let's okay. A little bit about politics. Okay. <laughs> so what made you run for you? What was your first office? You were a state representative? My first office was councilman, councilman and okay. then and vice mayor, okay. like council president in Shaker Heights. Okay. Ken, the fact is... When I was 10 years old, I knew that I wanted to, I had three things I wanted to do. I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Okay. That was the hot sport at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it was before basketball and football right, came exactly. more popular. Mm -hmm. I was particularly in the African-American community. I wanted to be an actor and mm -hmm. I wanted to get in politics. Mm -hmm. And I knew that when I was 10 years old. It's not because I had actors in my family, not because I had politicians in my family, mm -hmm. but as I would watch the news and watch TV programming, those were the things I found. Oh yeah, I'd like to do that. Right, right. One day. And by the time I was 13, 14, I knew I would probably end up in law school, mm. even though I didn't have any lawyers in my family. And okay. I don't even know at that age if I knew a lawyer. Right. Okay. But these are just some things. I kind of knew what my skills were, my, what my interests were, what mm. my passions were. And so I just tried to, and to this day, mm -hmm. you know, I pursued them. So it wasn't real shock. I, the first class I took in at Harvard was a pre was an effect like a pre-law class it was okay. about constitutional law mm -hmm. i knew i was going to major my parents wanted me to become a physician hmm. but i knew that was not going to be the route for me wow i had no way i could have survived biochemistry <laughs> physics chemistry yeah, classes biology yeah. no nah, i wouldn't cut out for that mm -hmm. you know i knew early on that i was going to major in government and that i'd probably end up in law school and that someday maybe i'd be an elected official Mm. So it wasn't necessarily a real surprise when I ran for, not to me, mm -hmm. that I would throw my hat into the ring and run for Shaker Heights City Council back in 1983. Okay. Um, and a friend of mine who was on Shaker Council at that time, Alan Malamed, yeah. I give him credit. I he was the Alan. one really urged me to to run for Shaker Heights City Council. Oh, okay. Yeah. You were successful with that. And you say you was vice mayor as well. Vice mayor as well. Then I ran for state senate in 1990. It was There were nine candidates in the race. Wow. Some of the top names at that point wow. in uh, greater Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, it was to succeed Lee Fisher. Okay. I finished second in that race to Eric Fingerhut. Yeah, I remember 1990. That. So you was in that race. I was in that race. Matter of fact, Fingerhut, that was his first time ever running, wasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And he, and he oh, had Mike oh, White support. Yeah, Mike White and support that was behind, critical. Mike, matter of fact, Mike had just became mayor. That's and right. Was on the road. And Eric Finger had okay. been his campaign manager. Exactly. I remember that. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you were in that race. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Joe Demert, uh, uh, Lana Moreski, mm -hmm. uh, Bob Boyle, who was a mayor out in Richmond Heights, Paul Oyaski, wow. who became the mayor in the city of Euclid, Tyrone Bolden, wow. who was in that race. Oh, it was quite the field. Wow. It was quite the field. Yeah, that was everybody. Yeah. Wow. So I finished second, but you know, mm -hmm. close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. So, <laughs> right. so I didn't get any part of the prize there. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, a couple years later, I was asked to run on the Democratic ticket as lieutenant governor in the state of Ohio. Yeah, so I, I did that. that. I that. We had no chance. Right. The head of the ticket was not strong. Right. We were running against Voinovich, who exactly. was an extremely popular exactly. governor. Right. Right. We're all kind of like sacrificial right. lambs. All right. It's like running against the wine. Yeah, really. Right. You, <laughs> You know, it's really a waste of time right. unless you're going to hope by that to achieve something yeah, in the exactly, future. Exactly. So even though we lost that race, I made a lot of friends around the state in Northeast Ohio. Exactly. So I ran in 1996 and was fortunate enough to get elected to the Ohio House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. I, I became second uh, vice president of Ohio Legislative Black Caucus. Okay. I was the ranking member on the House Finance and Appropriations Committee. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, not out of any vanity, but I had more substantive bills, mm. not bills renaming streets right, or highways, right. substantive bills passed than any other Democrat during my five years in the state. I can remember the one that pops to mind. Uh, the first is that I authored the legislation that created the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood. You know what? I remember that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's and true. there was another bill that made sure that homeowners were aware of certain tax breaks that they were by law entitled to, which many of them were not at all uh, conscious of. There was another measure that strengthened the anti-stalking law. Mm. And I can remember there was a bill I had offered to roll back the effective date of the Victims of Crime Reparation Fund, because mm. I had been approached by a woman who had been a friend of my mom's who had been brutally assaulted Mm. But because of when the assault occurred, mm -hmm. it was two years before the effective date of the Victims of Crime Reparation wow. Law. So she, could, she was not eligible for any compensation. Wow. And at that point, the Victim of Crime Reparation Fund had like a $30 million surplus. Wow. So I just thought to roll it back a couple of years to make more people, including okay. this woman uh -huh. I knew, mm -hmm. eligible to get compensation. That's right. And I beat the Speaker of the House, mm. which almost never happens, on a floor amendment. I offered it as legislation. It went nowhere. Then I had an opportunity. We were debating a bill that dealt with the Victim of Crime Reparation Fund. I offered that as an amendment, mm -hmm. and I defeated the Speaker of the House because I was able to attract votes from all the Republicans mm. who were very conservative, who anytime they could stick a finger at, poke right. a finger the eye of the speaker exactly who was a wonderful she was <laughs> tremendous uh joanne davidson mm -hmm. and um beat her on the on the floor amendment you didn't see democrats do that wow. you didn't see republicans didn't do, do that. that wow but i put together a coalition mm -hmm. that got that passed and I, one of the great feelings in my life was when uh ann roseman okay called me to tell me she had received her check wow maximum amount Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So those are some of the things That's that I did work. when I was a member of the General Assembly. And then I had the chance in 2002, uh, Jane Campbell had been elected mayor. Her seat mm -hmm. on the board of Cuyahoga County Commissioners was open. Mm -hmm. So I threw my hat in the ring for that. There was through the Central Committee was responsible That's for correct. appointing her mm -hmm. successor. Mm -hmm. And boy, did I work the Central Committee. Yeah, that was, I threw that was receptions a, throughout the yeah, that was county. A, that was, a, that was quite. That was a battle. <laughs> that was a matter of fact. We were on opposite sides of that. We battle. may have been. Oh, I no, think we, no were. <laughs> have, we were. We were. No may have. We were. Just, yeah. See, yeah. see I, I forgive all those who were formerly on other sides. Mean, it, 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 was, it, it was. It was. It was crazy. I, I, well, you worked for the county recorder at that time. Right. Yeah. Who recorder, was my opponent? Who wanted to run for the seat as yeah. well, and he he thought he had a. a a, a better shot at it, but I think I think I beat him. It was such a close race. I beat him sixty-one to thirty-nine percent. Oh yeah, it, 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 it was it was. And like, I remember those numbers. Oh yeah, it, it was an ugly, 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 ugly. The, the, but the, let me say this, Kent. The one thing I learned about my years in politics was that when people were supporting my opponent, mm -hmm. I still wanted to be friendly enough mm -hmm. so that in the future they could support me. Oh yeah. So that was always key to me. Never run a campaign that burned bridges. Right. Right. Well, it's it's a it's a thing I tell everybody. It's a sense of loyalty, and loyalty comes in all shapes and forms. Oh, yeah. it, it, it's the loyalty is in the fact that you got to support the people that you believe in and that you're you got stake with. But after they lose and you move on, the the next part of that is the ability to be able to work with the other person Absolutely. as well to show them Critical. the same type of loyalty. Because you know, one of the things I found out, Peter, in the game is that. Um, and this was one of the reasons why I kind of changed my attitude about politics a little bit is that I've been behind the scenes enough and done work behind the scenes. And you will really appreciate this. And you know that you as the candidate will be running and um, you and the other candidate will be doing exactly what I'm talking about during that process. But when the process is over with, there's work to be done. And even at some point or another, you guys got to work together. Y'all figure it out and y'all work it out. But me and your campaign managers and everybody else, we'd be ready to kill each other for years. Oh, yeah, after that. <laughs> after that. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, well, you were not. I'm like, wait a minute, man. That is over with, man. Oh, yeah. That, no, that it's like the Browns and the Steelers, yeah, man. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I got drafted. Now we all should be working together. But I think sometimes they just, you know, that's well, the most well, difficult part of it. You know, it's interesting you should say that because I am far more forgiving mm -hmm. for those who are on the other side from me and mm -hmm. various battles mm -hmm. over the years. Than my wife is. Right. 
Right. Oh, my wife takes it far more personally <laughs> exactly. than I exactly. do. Exactly. Exactly. Right. She's still angry at people <laughs> from 20 years ago. <laughs> exactly. And meanwhile, I'm having breakfast and lunch with her. <laughs> right. You know, you're like, we're fine. Well, they'll let her see you calling. Oh, this no, year, no, no. Turn this into something else. You know, it's like, come on. It's, it's over. It's over. It's over. And, 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 and that's kind of the, the nature of the game. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's sort of. That's how we are. Well, but some I, people just can't shake it. Man. I, I mentioned I've learned, you know, from acting, I've learned the importance of resiliency, because mm. especially when you're starting out, you get told no far more often, right. far, far, far more often right. you'd be, than you're told yes. Mm -hmm. And you have to not take the fact that somebody didn't cast you in a certain role personally. Mm -hmm. And you have to go back, be prepared to give 100 percent on your next audition. Mm -hmm. And what politics taught me was to be more thick skinned mm. about things. And again, to not take them personally. If somebody disagrees with me on an issue and you move forward, mm -hmm. you know, you can't get stuck, whether it's in acting or in politics with the battles that you had yesterday and the, the, the defeats or the disappointment you have to move forward. Do, do you like politics today, the way it is? Today? Well, let me, uh, oh, I'm glad I'm not in it. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I think things are more dysfunctional yeah. now, mm -hmm. especially in Congress and mo and state legislatures. Mm -hmm. State legislatures are just, yeah. the state is just really, um, it, it's toe up, man. And see, that's why I was fortunate yeah. because the speaker, the, the Republican speaker of the House, Joanne Davidson, when I was in the legislature, mm -hmm. was a moderate, came from an urban area, Columbus. Mm. And so there were things that we could, Compromise, Almost compromise on and agree right, on. Right, 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 right. You know, so it's a very different dynamic that mm -hmm. exists there. People ask me, do I miss politics? I said, I've got two answers for you. I said, the one thing, the serious, the answer that will sound serious to you is that I miss being in position where I could help people who deserved and needed help by offering a piece of legislation, by establishing a program, by making a phone call, by voting a, a certain way on an issue. And I miss on occasion, I miss having a voice that matters on the matters of the day. I still think I have a voice and I still have access mm -hmm. so that I can make my opinions felt, mm -hmm. but I miss those two things. But here's what I don't miss. And yeah. the answer might sound comical, <laughs> but it is absolutely true. I no longer have to go place. I don't want to go. That's a big deal. I don't have to speak to people. I don't care to speak to. Big deal. And I don't have to be nice to people I detest. That's, it's a it's like freedom. <laughs> right. I like January 1st, right. 2011 was Emancipation Day for me in that <laughs> respect. <laughs> okay. You know, and you hit them right on the head. Those are the three biggest things. I, I mean, really? Those are the things right there. I mean, let's go because we're going to get on this politics a little bit. Do you think that since you left, you were part of the last of the Mohicans? of uh, the way we used to do government. County government. Do, do you think we should have kept it the way we did it, or you think we... Well, this is what I think we should have done. And it's interesting because I, I was invited to the City Club on several occasions mm -hmm. to debate county government reform before the reform that finally made it to the ballot and took place. This is what I always felt. I thought there were positions that we didn't need in the county level. Mm -hmm. With all due respect, I know you worked for the recorder's mm -hmm. office, but I didn't think we needed mm -hmm. to elect a county recorder. Okay. I didn't think we should be electing a county engineer. Mm -hmm. I didn't think we should elect a county coroner because those are technical positions. Mm -hmm. Correct. But I always felt it literally analyses in books on the topic showed that the county council, county executive form of government is more bureaucratic, more red tape, and costs more than the three Correct. commissioner form of government. Correct. My Correct. thought was you keep the three commissioners, you appoint the engineer, mm -hmm. the sheriff, mm -hmm. uh, the coroner, mm -hmm. you merge the positions of auditor and recorder, and you appoint them. That's what I supported. Correct. And I think that would have been a much more sensible approach. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, because of the misdeeds of the then county uh, auditor and one of the county commissioners and, you know, a lot of the other county officials, the county recorder and the county mm -hmm. sheriff got in trouble. Mm -hmm. So that created a momentum just to throw the baby mm -hmm. out with the bathwater. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's what happened. Oh, no, they, they definitely threw the baby out. They 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 put everything one bad apple and they just let it snowball into the ridiculousness of what it is now. And I believe that Chris Ronane will do will be more successful mm -hmm. and effective than the previous county executives. But I haven't seen anything yet that makes me believe that this system is superior, not superior, not even the equal, equal. of the but, previous system. And, 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 and what a one last question, mm -hmm. one last comment mm -hmm. on this. What amused me 
Okay. Is that when the plane dealer was supporting county government reform, mm -hmm. they were saying the problem isn't the players, the problem is the system. Right. Now, when they've had less than effective county executives, they say, oh, the problem isn't the, the system, system, the problem well, is the, the players. Player. Right. And that's the part that, you know, I had Chris Ronane on the show, and, and the name of his show was Heavy is the Crown. Heavy is the crown. I said, we're going to call it the Heavy the is the was, Crown yeah. because, brother, you're going to wear it, and it's not easy. No. And, and, and I said, because we're going from a system where they had three people to maybe eight different people doing the job that they've given to one person to do mm -hmm. right now. I believe, to your point, that Chris Ronane would do a better job than Armin only because Armin did a better job than Ed. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, and so Chris got to do a better right, job right. than Armin. The bar is kind of low. The, right, right. And, and, and it's low. And we started. And I love Armin. He's a good friend of mine. But, but we started something new that's there. It, it's sort of like we say that, you know, Donald Trump lived off of all the work that Obama did. Mm hmm. Now, when you start off with a government that has nothing and we starting off fresh to zero, you had your first executive who basically came in and came out. He wanted to run for governor. So all the real work was nothing there. It was what Armin had to do, which everybody said was, hey, you ain't do much of anything. So now it's on you, Chris. And I think he's in the same boat. I think it's not. I think it's like what the plane dealer said. It's the system. And you guys just got upset with Armin, and so now it's Armin. But yeah. as soon as you get mad at Chris, Chris, be, they'll be beating the drum for somebody <laughs> beating new. Beating the drum for somebody new. And, and then they'll be back. Because this is what I watched. I watched Chris on the city, not the city club. He did the Plain Dealer editorial. Okay. And cool. they said on the editorial then that they thought that, well, you think we ought to change the government back and the government wasn't this oh, and they that. Yeah, that. they actually said that. And I said, you know, they got a lot of gall to just say like, hey, well, we tried it. It didn't work. So maybe we ought to just switch it back just like that. Well, th there's a bit luck. There's what? 88 counties in Ohio mm -hmm. and 86 counties have the three commissioner form of government. Wow. 86 counties can't all be wrong. Right. Right. So let me ask you this on that, because, uh, again, I, we all wish Chris the best luck. We're going to be working with him on it. When we talk about the sheriff, though, do you believe the sheriff? You mentioned the sheriff should be appointed because they're going back to that now. Do you think we ought to elect the sheriff or you think he ought to stay appointed? Let me say, I think the sheriff and the prosecutor are the positions you can make arguments pro and con, mm -hmm. pro and con, because especially with the prosecutor, because of the important role mm -hmm. that he or she plays in administering justice, mm -hmm. I think some degree of control that the public ought to have control and vote on who's the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. I think you might be able to make that argument for the sheriff, but it's to a lesser extent than the prosecutor. Okay. And why can we never elected a, our public defender? Why is he appointed and not elected? I guess who knows, maybe there's certain inertia initially. You know, I don't even, I don't know enough about the evolution of the public defender's office mm -hmm. to answer that. But I have the feeling that we had a County prosecutor, long before we had a public defender. I think at some point in the history of the county, there was the, the need was felt to have a public defender to represent the rights mm -hmm. of those who simply don't have the financial means to represent themselves and mm -hmm. to protect their interests. So that's why I think that came about as an appointment in that process. Mm -hmm. And so there was never any thought about electing the public defender. He, he, they're elected in some states. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I just noticed that they were well, elected here. I just think it was because of how it evolved. Mm -hmm. You know, it evolved, the position evolved long after you had a county prosecutor. So let's go national a little bit. What do you think okay. about our man, Mr. Biden, man? You think old Joe is ready for another four years? Peter, can, can we get four more out of Joe? He'd be, what, 80-something by that time now? Well, you know, as, as somebody who just <laughs> turned 70, I like to think older, <laughs> older guys still have a, still a utility, yeah, right? okay. The question is, as a Democrat, who other than Joe Biden mm. can defeat the likely Republican candidates? Mm. And I'm not sure we have somebody who's ready to step in mm. and defeat the other Republican candidates, particularly if it's somebody like uh, Ron DeSantis. I think Joe Biden could beat Trump again. Okay. I think almost any Democrat could beat Trump. Trump has a limited mm -hmm. level. Of, his support is vociferous. Right. Uh, his 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 support is maniacal, mm -hmm. but there's only so far he can go. And I think he's maxed out. But some of these other Republican candidates who are a little smoother, don't have some of the ethical challenges mm -hmm. Trump does, 
can pose a greater a threat to a Democratic candidate. So um, I know there are a lot of Democratic governors that mm-hmm. people are singing their praises. There's a few. They might be, I don't know if they'll be ready next year. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I have some misgivings, certainly the, in all seriousness, the age factor is a factor because mm-hmm. he's going to be, you know, 84, 85 if, when his next term would end. Mm-hmm if I remember correctly. And I think the discovery of documents at his home Mm -hmm. kind of takes away one of the issues that that we had uh, in the presidential election, particularly against Trump. And they keep finding them. Yeah. (laughs) Every day they keep finding more. Every day there's a new, every day we find something else flying over the United (laughs) States and and some other classified document document. in an elected, retired or current elected officials. That's definitely not, that's definitely not helping Joe. Yeah. And, and and it's just like what you said is Joe almost got to run like a black man. It's like, you know, our, they say we got, our stuff got to be squeaky clean. Clean. It it ain't like you can go in there because they're going to find, they already going in with this Hunter Biden, which they still have never found nothing on Hunter, but But they're going to keep up the drumbeat. They're going to keep that up. And and that's what the Republicans in the house have said. They've got all these committees that have been started to just go over these kinds of issues, oh, yeah. the over last and election, over and over and over Hunter over. Biden, you know, anything else that they think they could seize on mm-hmm. to um, diminish the stature of our current president. What about Kamala Harris, man? Do you think she's going to be able to withstand? No, you know? no. no I, I just don't think. I don't think I, Joe I, did her any justice. And, and what I mean nah. by this is that Obama, President Obama, made Joe a cool vice president. Mm-hmm. He, Obama was just that cool that just spilt out on him. You know what I mean? But he also made sure you saw videos, you saw clips, you saw things where they were interacting. You don't see none of that. Well, with I don't them think at I, all. Well, at, at I, all. I don't think that they ever. I don't know if he ever really liked her. Right. You can uh, tell, particularly, it, it, it particularly like because it. of the, you know, during the primary, she said some things that mm-hmm. he understandably took umbrage to. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if people get over that, but he saw that with her on the ticket, mm-hmm. it could solidify support from him mm-hmm. in a number of different communities, you know, amongst mm-hmm. women, mm-hmm. amongst Asian Indians, mm-hmm. amongst African Americans, mm-hmm. with the HBCU crowd. Correct. You know, either further strengthening his hand in California, which mm-hmm. really, I don't know when the next time, with the Republican next time right. when. California hell will have frozen <laughs> right. over. So I think those were the reasons that motivate not any personal affinity and mm-hmm. affection for mm-hmm. her. Honestly, I've always heard this, and I think it makes a lot of sense that the American people tend to elect as their president the candidate that they would most be interested in have sitting down and having a beer with, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Think about it. Biden over Trump, right. Trump over Hillary Clinton, because mm-hmm. she was viewed as very cold That's and correct. distant, wasn't really likable. Obama over McCain and Romney. Mm-hmm. George Bush over Al Gore, who was viewed as a bit stiff and a bit mm-hmm. of a, you know, a scold when it came to the environment. Right. I think Kamala lacks that warmth. Right. And again, there's nothing that's happened during her tenure as vice president where she's either shown leadership or been in position. He said she was in charge of the border. The border hasn't gotten any better. I don't I don't, I don't see, see how she I no, she's I, not gonna be the Democratic she, nominee. She, she can't be the nominee and, and again and it goes back to she'd what, run she if Biden run. did. Uh, yeah, but, but it, she's it, not gonna win. It goes back to what you were just saying about not having anybody. We don't have anybody. I don't really think we've got anybody well positioned to beat of DeSantis. And, and, and we don't have anybody positioned, nor have we developed anybody to the point of what I'm saying by Biden, not even saying, hey, even if I don't like her for the benefit of the party, I better start looking Promote like we're promoting bit. somebody. Because yeah. at this point, we if it's not you, brother, who? If it's not Biden, then who? Yeah, I mean, and that that's really tough, man. All right, Peter, we're going to go on into the good part of your okay. life, man, All right. because, you know, the political stuff is the politics. It's not going nowhere, and we'll be back to talk <laughs> we'll more talk about, about that another later. day. Yeah. Let's talk about what's really interesting is that you went from the political stuff, and we had a ugly little situation that happened in county government, and um, as a result of that, you were leaving, not because of that, because your term My was My term up. got uh, cut in half, half mm-hmm. and, and they changed government, and you was like, Hell with y'all. Y'all wanted y'all to work with it because we begged you to be executive. Remember, I know. We had that I know. We had that conversation. Yeah, and, and so um, at that point. I just didn't have the desire. Exactly. Right then, the heart that you need to mm-hmm. campaign mm-hmm. and to serve. And it was those a bad last time. two years. Those yeah. last two years mm-hmm. really destroyed a lot of my love. Exactly. For public office exactly. and public service I can in that capacity. That. I can totally understand yeah. that. I understand that, man. It, it, was, it was really bad. So, and, and God willing and everything, you made it out of it unscathed. Absolutely. And so, so in that, you know, it's like, well, shit, Peter went from 
being that to he's acting and nobody was in believing that might be. thank you for saying that nobody thank believed you for that. saying you know that. i'm gonna say nobody, nobody believed like that that peter acted like okay you're right we'll see it when we see yeah. it right <laughs> you know, so then I can hey my old wife thought i was crazy yeah, yeah. Right? they had to be it, it's sort of like when i woke up and said i'm starting a podcast like really yeah, okay you yeah, must right. trying to get paid from youtube i'm like no <laughs> I, I ain't trying to work that hard trust me <laughs> it was like yeah he's gonna be on this play on in careful i think that was the first that's the first thing and that's as far as it'll go yeah right right. it was like okay y'all gonna go see peter people going to see peter you want to support peter and do his thing and 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 that was good and then from there let's take us down how it went from you decide i'm well i'll be honest with you when i first started acting and and the only reason i hadn't acted for 30 years almost Mm. and i had a my first play that Mm. i had written and i wrote it when i was a college student but it was getting i was on the board of caramu and they ended up giving it a a production Mm. full production of the family line and so i always say my plays are like my fourth fifth and sixth children really you know because i gave birth to them uh you know with with my own kids i only did half the work matter of fact i didn't even do half (laughs) the work really let's be honest but with these plays i mean they were entirely my creation and so i would go watch the plays every night as though i had never seen my watch the Mm -hmm. performance and i became friends with terrence spivey who was then the artistic director at caramel exactly and when and Terrence and I would chat, and when mm-hmm. he found out I used to act and that I used mm-hmm. to, um, and that I knew something about theater, he invited me to participate in a stage reading. And the stage reading was going to be at the old Cleveland Playhouse up on Carnegie right. Avenue. And uh, Bill Cobb and Ruby D were right. in it. Right. And I said, and I thought to myself, oh, I'll be on stage with mm-hmm. Bill Cobb and Ruby D. And all I have to do is read the stage directions mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know, and require any memorization or any real work. I said, sure, I'll do that. So after that was done, Karen's came back to me and said, there's a play I'd like to put up one day, but I'd like to do a stage reading. And I'd like you to consider reading the lead role. Mm. And I said, fine, I'll do that, you know, because it was fun. And with the stage reading, you don't have to memorize anything. You know, there are no costumes, no props. It's pretty easy. And then you after know, that, I just kind of said, you know, I'm gone. I'd like to, to tell act us. again. You had to tell us, what's the stage reading? So Okay, a stage reading is actors sit with the scripts in front of them on a stage with a music stand where they rest their scripts and they just read the play. Just read. Just read it. Okay. You know, of course, you act it out vocally, Mm -hmm. but you don't have blocking where you have to move certain places on the stage. You don't have costumes. Mm -hmm. Uh, You don't have to memorize lines. Okay. So it lacks all the elements of a full production. They give you that ahead of time or you? Well, you generally have even a rehearsal or two with the stage reading. Okay. I'm getting ready to do one in uh, next month. And there's a couple of rehearsals in advance for the stage reading. Oh, so they'll give you rehearsals before you actually do the actual stage reading. Sure. Oh, sure. Because they do want you, they do want to have a little chemistry established between the actors Mm -hmm. and they do want you to be more familiar with the piece. Okay. And there are some things that the director you know, even a stage reading has a director, so there's certain things directors will want to focus on mm. in the script. Mm-hmm. But it's really just you in the script. Really? Actors in the script, right? Nothing else. So that was your first one? You were so, so I did two stage readings, mm-hmm. and then after the second one, I said, man, I think I'd like to act again. Mm. So I auditioned for a play at Karamu, mm-hmm. and I uh, was cast in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, then one thing after another, you know, I said, okay, I think I want to get an agent so I can do a little voiceover work. You do plenty and, of that. And so though, I right? do a fair amount of that. Mm-hmm. And then one day I'm in the green room uh, going on stage at um, Weathervane Playhouse. Mm-hmm. We were doing Caramu Ensemble collaboration with Weathervane. We were doing The Great White Hope. Mm-hmm. And uh, an actor in the green room says, hey, they're casting a film in Akron tomorrow starring Corbin Burnson, who used to be on L.A. Law. It's an open audition. And I said, oh, well, I got to be in Akron tomorrow anyway. Mm. So I auditioned for that. I got cast in that film. Then I started getting, you know, a little more interest. So, okay, so, maybe so, I can take this a little further. So you have to, you know, like I said, we're going to try to give our folks something. So I, I pull out a little bit. So when you say you cast for that, you just went there and just walked in and say, I want to audition for this? Oh, this was an audition unlike any I had been in because it was really what they call an open call. Okay. So you had the soapbox derby venue at Aquin was filled with people when I showed up for the audition. Wow. So you had two things. You could do either of two things. You could fill out your form, attach your headshot, and just turn it in, then you mm. could leave. Or you could get in this long line and actually meet Corbin Burnson. Really? So I was there, and the line was really long. And I said, I'm just going to staple my headshot to this, this form I had to fill out and leave it. So then I, I was hungry, so I went and had lunch and just read the newspaper. And then a, a couple hours passed, and I said, I wonder if that line still is long. Let me go back and check it out. So I drove back and it was like down to 40 people. 
Really? So I said, okay, I'll stick around so I can meet him. Mm -hmm. So I go up to the table where he's sitting. He's writing something. I say, Mr. Bernson, I'm glad you're bringing this film to Northeast Ohio. And and I'm in a play in Akron tonight. If you aren't doing anything, why don't you come see it? And uh, he's he's still looking down. He said, oh, it's been a long day. I probably won't have the energy to go to a play. And then he looks up and he says, oh, he'd be perfect to play the husband of the school teacher in the play, in the movie. Just like so, that. Yeah, just like that. So that's how I got my first role in a film. Wow. Yeah, called 25 Hill. That was the name of it, 25 Hill. Wow. Was and he the, of course, was he in it or he was He directed? was in it, he wrote it, and he directed it. Wow. That's how it started. And then I started networking with people who were also actors. Mm-hmm. And they were, say, so I got an agent in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. And then I met, remember meeting with the guy and he told me I ought to get an agent in Detroit. And through my agent in Detroit, I ended up getting cast and uh, going auditioning and getting cast in Detroit 187, which was an ABC crime drama. So why why he picked Detroit? I would think California. Oh, oh, because Detroit at that time had a film tax credit and they were doing a lot of stuff. Wow. And Detroit's closer. I can get to Detroit in a couple of hours. Right, that's true. Right. That's true. So I can audition for things there. So let's talk about that because you hit about this tax credit. In Ohio, I had uh, Sheila Wright on the program. Okay, we sure. talked about the tax credit and the film tax credit and the importance of that. Is Ohio shortchanging ourselves? Yes, we having- are. We need, well, there are two things. We need to have an unlimited cap mm-hmm. or certainly raise the $40 million cap mm-hmm. because we're expending that money quickly. Mm-hmm. And then other productions want to come here and there's no money for them. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is to have what they call have it on not just one annual deadline, but to have it rolling. Mm-hmm. so that if you, you don't meet that deadline, there's a number of deadlines you right. have year-round applications mm-hmm. so people aren't shut out because they missed the, the one deadline. simple right. deadline. Or got to shoot during a certain period of time of the year, which could be crummy up here, yeah. weather-wise. Interesting. Yeah. All right, so what was your, after that, what was your next role? Well, Detroit 87 was kind of big because that was an ABC crime drama Okay. with Michael Imperioli of The Sopranos. Okay. And let me just parenthetically say, oh, great guy. That, that's the one that's on your... Um, yeah, on real. Yes. I okay. think it's the first thing on my reel. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 And then I continued to do stage acting, became a member of, the, I think with Detroit 187, I became a member of SAG AFTRA. Okay. I did a play at Cleveland Playhouse. I, that's how I became a member of Actors Equity, which is the stage actors union. Okay. And then, you know, Alex Cross playing the minister in the scene, and Alex Cross was probably the next big thing. And then White Boy Rick. I mean, all of this mm-hmm. over a series of years. But let me tell you something trying to make headway as a professional actor is far harder to me than winning an election. Oh, it got to everybody think they are actors. There you go. Everybody. And I felt, and, and there are things you can control. Mm-hmm as a candidate. You know that if you raise more money than your opponent, if you know the issues better, if you outwork your opponent, Mm -hmm. you stand a pretty good chance of winning. All of that is almost out of the door. You have to be talented as an actor. You have to Mm -hmm. certainly outwork those, uh, your competitors, but that doesn't guarantee anything because it's so subjective. subjective. It's based on so many external factors of which you have no control. Now you say he was looking down and he just heard you talking and then just looked up and looked at you. If he hadn't looked up, You know, he was, it'd been a long day for him, as he said. He just happened to look up. Wow. And I know that getting that role encouraged me to go further with mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. to push the envelope further. But the same attributes, personal attributes that I applied to politics, law, et cetera, I applied to this. Mm-hmm. That is network hard and work even harder. Be personable. If people like you, you'll get more opportunities than if they don't. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to be somebody they want to work with, somebody they want to vote for, somebody they want to hire. So how about you like the theater more than the film? Well, there's two different. I like them both, but for different reasons. Okay. When it comes to theater, I like the rehearsal process. You become a team. You get to know the other actors better. Mm -hmm. And so it's like being on a sports Mm -hmm. team. The immediate reaction you get from the audience in theater is so different. Yeah. Every night is different. You feed off them, whether they're laughing or whether Mm -hmm. you can feel that they're paying attention to every word and that you've got them completely in your hand. And also the other challenging thing about acting that can be fun and can also be frightening. And no performance, every performance is different. No performance is the same. Right, right. And I can't tell you the number of times when somebody misses a line. I've had time when I was supposed to walk out in the scene with another actor (laughs) and he was nowhere to be found. Wow. So I had to adjust my dialogue 
to no longer direct it to this actor, but to direct it to the other actors who were on wow. stage. Wow. I can remember one time, and this was, you know, I did the, the gospel according to James at Ensemble Theater. This is a very, very dramatic moment in which I'm talking about two people who had been hung. Mm. So the lights go up on one actor, and he's there. The lights go up on the second actor. He's not where he's supposed to be mm. when, the, when the light is focused on him. And I have to, you know, first there's the shock of not seeing him there, but then quickly I've got to figure out how to deal how with to this. deal with that. So that's what you wrote, the live audience. So that's what's exciting about live theater. What I hate about film and TV work is that you do a scene ad infinitum, ad nauseum over and over again. I've had been in scenes where they've shot it 50 or 60 times from different angles. You're doing the same thing. And so it, it can be a bit tiring. And then, so they do all these different angles and decide which one they like better. Right. Wow. The director wants to have all the options. Mm. So when it's time to edit, he's got it from every angle and wow. all kinds of different iterations of it. Yeah, I went and saw, um, I had a red carpet screening for a man called mm -hmm. Otto out mm -hmm. at Cinemark. Mm -hmm. We rented one auditorium. We ended up needing four. Wow. I thought 200. I was hoping to sell 250 seats. We sold 500. Wow. I was hoping to raise 15 to 20 grand from my parents' scholarship fund when all the dollars are finally mm -hmm. in would be closer to 40,000. Excellent. So we rented the large auditorium. The, the screen's like 120 feet. Mm -hmm. So see yourself on a 120 foot screen. Right. That right. does something for your ego. Right. Right. So, so, so the, and when you know, for example, with a man called Auto, I've been getting, people have been texting me and, and calling me from literally around the world where mm -hmm. they've seen the film. I, I got my opinion on a man called Auto. Okay. And, and, and others. Now, I, I watched you in, because Latif, you know, my producer here, he, he said, you know, Peter's coming on the show. And he was like, Peter was in this movie, but I said, I know. He said, well, I told Peter about you. And he said the same thing. Oh, I know, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> so he was like, I said, yeah. He said, but you got to watch this movie he was in. I said, what was it? He said, a man called Otto. So I said, I'm going to make sure I'm making my business to watch To watch it. Thank you for building my residuals. Yes. I, and I wanted to make sure I did. <laughs> but to me, Peter, I thought the role you played in, what was it, 911? Chicago Ch Fire. Chicago Fire was a better role. I would agree with you. Because I had more lines. Okay. What I was challenged to do in A Man Called Auto mm -hmm. was to convey feelings as a stroke victim mm. through facial expression and a minimum of physical gestures. How do you audition? Well, first, my agent, local agent, got me the audition, secured the audition. And I have a videographer that I work with, Mark Moore, and Mark will put me on film. He's also an actor, so he reads the lines. And he does a great job with that. For that particular audition for A Man Called Auto, I called in my friend Jean Madison, and she read the my wife's lines. And then she also, I don't, spoiler alert, so don't listen for the next few seconds. She held the tube that I need, that I was grabbing, because in that scene with with Tom Hanks. I know what he's planning to do and I'm trying to stop him. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, that's why I grabbed this tubing that he okay, had. Right. So I needed to create that tension because I have to feel that tension to act it. You know, if I wasn't tugging on that, I'm not going to feel the same way. I had to feel that that's what I'm doing. You, you know, know what? That, that's what you was doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know why you did that in the movie. That's I know, why I was doing it. Because you knew he to was prevent trying to... Him. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Because that, that moment is set up when, when he comes to... The, the comes into my house. He hasn't seen me in years. Correct. And he says to uh, my wife, does he even know we're here? Right. Exactly. And she says, oh, yeah, he's still in there. Exactly. And that was my way of showing, oh, yeah, okay. I'm aware of everything that's being said. Got you. Right. Okay. Hey, I saw it. That's why you grab him like that. Right. You know? So so when, when and what I'm really grabbing is, is the tubing. So and when I had the call back, you know, they, they called my agent called and said, oh, they want to see you mm -hmm. again, which means down to the final two or three people from whom they're going to make a selection. The director wants. So the director was on this. It was by Zoom. Mm. The director was on the call. One of the casting directors was on the call and maybe somebody else, a production team. I didn't have anybody for the Zoom. So I had to take a piece of uh, that kind of exercise, you know, exercise bands that Bunny, you use. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, placed it around the um, back of a chair mm -hmm. and pulled it to keep, create that same tension. And at one point, the director said to me after we shot it the first time, he said, okay, now let me see your hand holding that tube. He wanted to see how my hand looked grabbing that piece of tube. Wow. That's the process. Mm. That's the audition process. Most auditions now, you used to have to go into where, uh, you know, a big casting room for an audition. Now you tape them and send them in. Mm. And it's great. It, on the one hand, it allows more people to compete for roles. Right. But the good more. news is that you don't have to travel. 
mm-hmm. to New York. You don't have to get on a bus or yeah. drive or yeah. catch a plane to go audition. Mm-hmm. It can all be done. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's electronic, so it's all out there now. Right. It's everybody. Mm-hmm. Everybody wow. can compete. Wow. And, and so competing, how hard is it to be an actor? Yeah, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. That's why so many people start and quit. And you think being at a coming in at a later age in your career was that an advantage or a disadvantage? Yeah. I one time had somebody tell me that it's an advantage because all the people who would have been your age who started 30 years ago and quit (laughs) out of frustration. (laughs) So you're like the last man standing. That's true. That's but here's the thing: middle-aged men always have roles. There's always roles available. Any show, somebody's playing the dad, the uncle, the judge, Mm -hmm. the grandfather. Mm -hmm. So I'm still competing with a whole lot of people, Mm -hmm. but um, I don't think it's a disadvantage. Okay. And the other thing is a lot of people, it's a matter of life and death, whether they eat or not, Mm -hmm. when they come in at an earlier age, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have that kind of pressure. I got you. I got Social Security. Yeah, I got my PRS yeah, pension. Right. I'm still practicing right. law. Right. Still got my right. consulting practice. I'm teaching acting. You're not a starving artist. Right. I'm not a starving artist. That's correct. So I don't have those same kind of pressures. And when you have those kind of pressures, sometimes you don't perform as well. So let me ask you, give up another little Hollywood secret or whatnot, <laughs> if there's such a thing. Oh, there are plenty of them. How do I'm amazed that when I see your Samuel Jackson's, your Kevin Hart's, some of these guys, and and even yourself and others, man, do y'all actually have to memorize all of those damn lines? They they remember all those movies. They go. How do you prepare for something? How do you think they prepare to do? And you have and you have to memorize it. I think it's tougher for a play than a a movie because a movie you don't have much rehearsal. Okay, you'll run a rehearsal one time, then act say, okay, we're gonna film, we're gonna shoot. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you do it in segments. Mm-hmm. So one day you need to know three or four pages. Another day, another couple of pages. So it's very different. So you really have to be, I don't want to say smart, but you got to have some intelligence. To, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the, the think that you could just go out there and act. No. You know? And, you know, everybody thinks, like you said right. earlier, everybody thinks they can be an actor. Yeah. Everybody thinks they can be a comedian. Everybody thinks that they can be a politician, run for office and win. But no, that's a, a, they're under a lot of delusions and illusions to think that. Mm-hmm. I was so, 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 yeah, no, you have to learn your lines. And that's oftentimes the toughest part. I don't find for me, I don't find it challenging at all to get into these characters, mm-hmm. whether I'm playing the guy with senility mm-hmm. on a uh, Chicago fire, the mm-hmm. retired police officer who's struggling with Alzheimer's mm-hmm. or well, I'm, whether I'm playing a stroke victim, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know. I think one, I understand motivation. I understand what motivates most human beings. I know myself. I know why I do everything that I do, <laughs> all my reactions. I know where they come from. And I believe we're all more or less the same in that respect. If I had been become a, a doctor, the only, there's only one area of medicine that interested me, psychiatry. Oh, you want to be with the crazy. Oh, yeah. Well, I want crazy, the human though, mind. The human mind. The human bro. mind. Yeah. I, you know, I, <laughs> I find that fascinating. All right. And so I think all of those things, those inclinations and whatever skills I've gained in that respect, help me understand a character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the things I've experienced, I've lived a long life. I've been in a lot of different settings. I've seen people in every walk of life and in every condition. Mm-hmm. So I have a frame of reference. Mm-hmm. I think in A Man Called Auto, when I play the older Reuben, not the 40-year-old Reuben, Mm -hmm. but the older Reuben, you know, I draw upon my father during his last year of life when he went into a precipitous decline Mm. physically and in his his ability to communicate. Okay. And so I think I probably drew upon that. You know, that's indelibly etched in my mind. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, a friend asked me the other day, so, oh, well, to prepare for that, did you go... Uh, into nursing homes and look at people. And I said, darn, that would have been a good idea. <laughs> you, I assumed you did. No, <laughs> no, I just, I knew it. Somebody said, you know, what you did with your mouth and your face right. and that, did you? No, I just kind of knew. 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 I just knew. Mm-hmm. So you you know what I, I tell you, because I made reference that I thought the um, movie you did, what was nine? Chicago, Chicago Fire. Chicago Fire. I don't want to keep calling it 911. My, Family watched that one all okay, the time. Okay. Chicago Fire. To play the role that you did play in a Tom Hanks movie on the big screen, mm-hmm. like you say, to even be in that role versus the other one, like you say, I think the credibility and to be amongst that, like you say, and amongst those stars in there, the your wife, they've definitely been on the screen and people know her from plenty of roles, Tom himself. 
And just the overall story of that, the story itself was really, really a, a good story. And it, it was definitely a, a Tom, I'm a Tom Hanks fan. So it, it wasn't you. a problem. Watching and let me it, tell you, he's, I knew he he's was a genius as an actor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's got a tremendous sense of humor and he's a good human being. Yeah, I could. So tell. he deserves everybody's adulation. So how often and, did you get to work with him? Well, all my, virtually all my scenes are with him. Mm-hmm. So I work with him uh, steadily. You know, um, was I, I, I was how, there how, over. I was there. Yeah, I was in right. out of Pittsburgh where it was shot uh-huh. for about two months from end of February to beginning of April. OK. And uh-huh. so he and I would have conversations in the hair and makeup unit mm-hmm. every day I was on set. Mm. You know, so Can he give you any tips. There were not really, but there were times when he and I would be figuring out what we wanted to do in certain scenes Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, touching a hand or or Mm -hmm. things like that. No, no. This was was fun. Chicago fires. The one time I remember an actor giving me an idea that I then embellished and acted upon. And I think it created a very beautiful moment. That was Chicago fire. Mm -hmm. The last scene when I'm sitting on the porch. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chief commander, Imam Walker's his real name, but mm-hmm. Bowden mm-hmm. comes up and talks to me. And he said that at the end of the scene, he, he suggested we were in between takes. And he said, I think we can make this scene better if at the end of the scene, after you hand me that fraternal order police cap, you look back at the at your house as if for one last time. Mm. Hand the cap, look back at the house. I said, that's a good idea. I go back into the holding area. It was a cold Chicago evening. So the holding area was actually the inside of a van. Mm. I go in, I think, and I come back and I say, you know, that was a great idea, but why don't we do it like this? I said, that moment when I hand you my cap, it's such a beautiful moment. It's such a connection between the two of us. Let's let that breathe all on its own. And then when we walk towards the gate to leave the house, that's when I'll turn and look back. So we create two beautiful moments. You did a good that job. That was pretty man. cool, man. That was a good. That was a good, that one. Every, every whole city was watching that one. Man. <laughs> the whole city that was yeah. blowing up on social media everywhere. Yeah, Everybody was, watched that one. So I thought yeah. that was really good. I love that. I love that. I love that role. And I remember when my videographer and I got mm-hmm. through with it, and I said, "Hey, let me take a. We mm-hmm. always, you know, take a look to determine which cut we want to use and send mm-hmm. in, submit." to the casting director. And I looked at that. I just felt that scene from the very first time that I was uh, mm-hmm. recording it for purposes of audition. Mm-hmm. There's certain things just hit. Well, I'm getting ready next. to do a full length feature film this summer, low budget film, mm-hmm. only about 75 grand. Uh, matter of fact, we're still looking for investors. So if you know anybody <laughs> that wants to be an executive producer of a film and have their name in mm-hmm. the credits, it's called The Last Shop on Walnuts. And I'm playing the lead in this. So okay. that's what's so exciting. We just did the table read for that. Just when the actors sit around and read through the script for the mm-hmm. first time, people were tearing up at the table read. Wow. This one of yours you wrote? Oh, no, I didn't write this. Uh, Jason Richardson wrote it. Okay. I worked with him on a previous project. So I'm excited about that because it's a complex character and I go through a range of emotions and mm-hmm. and to be able to be, I'm in almost every scene. And so Excellent. I'm carrying the film. So I mean, to me, that's the next level for me. Excellent. Well, Peter? We want to appreciate you coming on our program, man. You well, did been an excellent fun. job, man. We covered a whole lot of stuff, I don't stuff, think man. there was a moment in which somebody uh, wasn't saying uh, something. Oh, that's how we do it, yeah. man. And, and I really want you to continue to come on. We're going to be watching your career. Invite me. As everything comes out. Invite you know, me back and I'll know. say yes. Any premieres you got, please keep us in there. Okay. Or if you know I think we're going to be doing a premiere for um, uh, a man, The Last Shop on Walnut. Excellent. Excellent. You know? And we, we want to make sure we be a part of that. So what Consider I usually do with the on my show and i give you guys this camera you got this camera to say whatever you want if you want to tell people how they can reach if you need investors for your new movie let them know <laughs> all of that stuff i'm going to also leave how they can get in contact with you in in the disclaimer below and they'll be able to look at in the description box and get all that information so right now peter it's on you well i just want to thank you and the listening audience for tuning in to strategic moves with my good and longtime friend, Kenny Dow. And I want to say that I hope that during this discussion, I said something that perhaps you can apply in your everyday life. You know, I like to think that I'm the poster child for reinvention, for rejuvenation, for reimagination and renaissance, in, in even into one's middle years. So don't ever give up on your passions. 
uh, pursue them aggressively, be willing to do the work. It's not going to come for free. It's not going to come easy. But um, when you're pursuing your passions, there's nothing that makes it easier to get up every morning. And so then let me also say hi to my wife, Lisa, who's been so <laughs> tremendously supportive over the years. And to the three people who continue to inspire me, Ryan Charles Jones, Leah Danielle Jones, and Evan Cook Jones. Okay, love you and love you, Cleveland. That's Peter Lawson Jones. We'll see y'all next Sunday. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow.